Good morning. Welcome to the sanctuary of the United Methodist Church of Plano, or at least part of it. Uh, my name is Steve Saunders. I am the pastor here, and as uh, we give people a moment to, to jump on as uh, we go live here, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. If you're new to us, uh, this church was planted in Plano, Illinois in 1856. Uh, it has been and continues to be a part of the community, a pillar of the community, uh, we have an excellent working relationship. Hey, Arlene, good morning. And have had uh, an excellent relationship with the community as uh, we work with the school district, we work with uh, the health department. Hey, Kathleen, good morning. And uh, so that's just a, a tiny, brief little snapshot of, of us. If uh, you want a little bit of, uh, hey, Crystal, good morning. Ashley, good morning. So if you want a little bit more of a history of United Methodist Church of Plano, Illinois, you can check out our website at umcplano.org. Uh, you can hear a little bit about of our, our founding. Uh, there was a group of uh, a handful of people who wanted, uh, hey Lori, good morning, who wanted to uh, stake out some ground here in this area, Kendall County, Illinois, for Jesus. And uh, the light of Christ has been shining here since 1856. Uh, we're going on uh, 165 years in 2021. So we uh, continue to serve Christ here and, and hope that uh, his light continues to flow out of this place until he returns. Uh, so if you haven't been with us, uh, we're continuing our, our survey through the book of Hebrews. We're going to jump in in chapter 8. We spoke a little bit yesterday about uh, Jesus being referred to as a priest uh, in the order of Melchizedek. And we talked about who Melchizedek was and why it was important for uh, us to understand the connection between him and Jesus and, and why uh, our Heavenly Father said that Jesus would be like Melchizedek and have this eternal and forever um, priesthood and kingship. And we're going to move on into chapter 8 as uh, we talk about some of, the, uh, some of the issues and some of the important things about uh, the priesthood, and, and we're, we're, this will be a short one today. Um, chapter 8 is short. We don't need to study the whole chapter, but we're going to pick out some highlights and uh, pinpoint, again, some of the reasons why we know we can count on Jesus. Hey, Norris, good morning. Why, and why it's important for us to remember who Jesus is and what he's done. So let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you uh, for bringing us all together here virtually. Uh, thank you that uh, we continue to serve you even if I never leave the building. Thank you for the many ways you continue to reach people for your relentless love moves you to woo people into the kingdom as you seek the lost. And John Wesley said uh, he was grateful for your prevenient grace as your grace continues to call those not only believers but unbelievers into your fold where you can love them and care for them in a way in which no human being ever could. So continue to open our eyes as we study uh, the book of Hebrews. It's your word written for us. We pray it all, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, like the end of chapter 7 talks about Jesus being like Melchizedek. One who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy place, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifice. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were here on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. So I'm going to stop there for a minute. Jesus is, 
sacrifice on the cross was a once for all thing. We keep talking about that, but it's important for us to be reminded that there is nothing above or beyond the cross. There isn't any more work that needs to be done. There isn't another sacrifice, which is why when, when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, the sacrificial system was done away with. Because we didn't have to have the blood of bulls and goats anymore and have a continual priesthood offering sacrifices on our behalf. It was done once for all. But in verse 4, he says, Now, if he were here on earth, that's Jesus, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Well, Jesus walked this earth. They called him a rabbi and a teacher, but he wasn't a priest. There were other priesthood. There, there was the earthly line of priesthood that would continue to offer these sacrifices. Now Jesus coming from the line of Judah would not have technically been a priest because he didn't come from the Levitical priesthood. Hey Sue, good morning. Verse 5. They serve a co as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates. Much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. All right, so quickly. Moses is given command when he builds the tabernacle, builds the tent, you have to do it exactly the way I say. God prescribes and writes out this plan and how it was supposed to be done. God also gives Moses the Ten Commandments for the people to live by. And then the, as the Bible is coming together, the first five books of the Bible is called the Pentateuch, it's called the Torah, sometimes referred to as the Law. But this covenant that God made with his people is superseded because of Jesus' greatness, because of the glory that was accomplished when he died and rose again for you and for me. Jesus has now made a more excellent covenant. More excellent than the old covenant. The one that he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. What's the promise? If you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you can bank on the fact that you will be saved. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second one. So, what was wrong with the first covenant? It was made with broken people. God upholds his end of the covenant. But as sinful, broken people... Hey, Diane, good morning. But as sinful, broken people, we can't uphold our end of the covenant. It's impossible. Which is why Jesus came. Isn't that wonderful? Our God knew, after setting a standard of purity and righteousness and perfection, knew we would never be able to attain it. And because of his great love, he then sends Jesus, who is referred to as our high priest and king forever. He sends Jesus to be our final sacrifice, no longer needing any other uh, priests or sacrifices. It's done once for all. What was the motivation? Because of love. So the old covenant, the issue was us. Not God. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for the second. Now, he's going to go through a whole bunch, uh, a list here, and uh, quote some Old Testament scriptures. I'd invite you to go back and read from verse 8 and following, and I'm going to close on the last verse here, verse 13. The writer of Hebrews says, In speaking of a new covenant... He makes the first one obsolete. 
And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now this would, some of this is what got Jesus in trouble and some of the, the new Christians in trouble. As there were people, as we saw in the book of Galatians, who were trying, hey Mike, good morning, who were trying to combine Jesus with law adherence, with the old covenant. Well, Jesus came and forms a new covenant. And that is this covenant of blood. For those who trust in the covering of the blood of Christ, who are cleansed by his blood, blood are automatically brought in to this fold, brought in to this new covenant by Christ. Not because God couldn't uphold his end of the covenant, but because he knew from the beginning we were going to need this way of connecting with him, this way of being restored to him, and this way of being open to eternity with him. And the writer says, look, if the first covenant was fine, then Jesus would not have had to come. But he brings with him a more excellent covenant. Look, our faith in Christ is banked on truth and reality. The reality is that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the Son of God, walked this planet. He looked like one of us. It's skin and bones, yet being fully divine. Fulfilling a covenant we could never uphold because of a radical, unconditional love for us, and us meaning you and I, who were nowhere near being born when Jesus died, knowing full well who we would be and the sins we would commit and the issues we would have, said, I'm going to die for them, for all those who preceded them, and all those who will come after them. No longer needing the sacrificial system anymore, because our Savior is a once-for-all-time sacrifice. And we, can, we know we can bank on, hey, Tammy, good morning. We know it's true, because in the Old Testament, we were told that the Messiah would come. He would have to suffer. We would be healed by his stripes. He would rise again. Jesus said over and over and over, I will rise again. The Son of Man must be mistreated, will be scourged, will be condemned by man, will be falsely accused, will be handed over to the Gentiles, but I will rise again. And that's exactly what he did, sealing this new covenant with his blood. I know it sounds uncomfortable. I know sometimes it sounds, it's a little complicated. But the bottom line is, Jesus Christ loves you. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to understand not only this deep love that Christ has for us, but how he fulfills scripture, how he makes a new covenant, and how his blood is worthy of our trust, our salvation. And we can look to history and see that, yes, this man we call Jesus, God in human flesh, rose again to conquer sin and death on our behalf. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these continual reminders. Sometimes uh, as we're reading Hebrews, we might want to say, well, I thought we went over that already. I thought we talked about this. Why are you continuing to bring this up? And, and what does this have to do with anything? And we're grateful that you continue to open our minds and reveal to us that, that we need to be reminded of the great and majestic work Jesus did on our behalf. And we need to know, well, maybe on a daily basis, um, this stuff doesn't really have any kind of connection with us, but 
It really does. So thank you for helping us to unpack some of this and, and who Melchizedek is and, and why Jesus is better, uh, why his covenant is better, and, and all of this stuff. Continue to burn it into our hearts and our minds that we would, have, we would be people who have your truth hidden in our heart as you continue to reveal truth through us by your Holy Spirit. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for your word and for the way that you've protected it for thousands of years. We pray all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, hey, Red, good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, well, everyone, I, um, you know, I'm not a photographer and I'm definitely not a producer, but uh, today seemed like a good day to get some of the windows in, so I, I'm hoping that you can uh, actually get a good view. It might look different to me, but um, I'm hoping that you had a good view of uh, our stained glass window with uh, Jesus in the garden. And uh, may, uh, may that picture be for you a sign of hope, as there he is, the Savior, the one that we've been talking about, the one who will have a priesthood like Melchizedek, is there praying on, uh, on our behalf and, and seeking, knowing that uh, the fulfillment of Scripture is about to happen, that he's about to be turned over to sinful man, that he's about to be tortured and falsely accused, nailed to a cross, and yet rise again. So I hope that visual goes with you today. We'll see you tomorrow as we jump into Hebrews chapter 9. Have a great day.